Okay, so um, what I'd like to talk about today is how the mind works from a Buddhist perspective. And I'm going to base this talk on two sutras that are found in the Majjhima Nikaya. And I've actually prepared a presentation, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, uh, so just give me a minute. Let me find it first. Sorry, just give me one minute to put it into slideshow. Okay, sorry, now I've lost you guys. Um, Share screen. There it is. <clears throat> and then I'll do slideshow. Okay, so hopefully you can see that okay. So this um, this is the Vam Vamika Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya, Sutta number 23, and it's called the Anthill Sutra. And it's a wonderful sutra. Uh, I'm going to read some of it to give you a flavor of it. And um, it's a wonderful way into understanding all the um, structures that we put in place that make up the mentality and the, the processes of the mind. And it's, um, it's got lots of wonderful components. It's a dream. It's got a lot of symbolism. Um, it brings in the spiritual aspect and all the different layers that block us from liberation. So this, I'm, I'm not going to read all of it. Um, I'll, it's a short sutra anyway, but I'll go into the, the part where the uh, monk who has a dream takes the dream to the Buddha for the Buddha to um, interpret. So he goes to the Buddha and he, so I'll start with the section where he goes to the Buddha and then I'll go into the, the actual dream a little bit more in detail. So then, when the night was over, the venerable Kumara Kasapa went to the Blessed One. After paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and told the Blessed One what had occurred. Then he said, Venerable Sir, what is the anthill? What the fuming by day? What the flaming, what the fuming by night? What the flaming by day? Who is the Brahmin? Who the wise one? What is the knife? What the delving? What the bar? What the toad? What the fork? What the sieve? What the tortoise? What the butcher's knife and block? What the piece of meat? What the Naga serpent? So this is um, like any of us waking up from a dream, having this question of this incredible dream with lots of images. So now I'm actually going to go back and read the dream so that you get an idea of what was in the dream. So in the dream, um, when the night was well advanced, a certain deity of beautiful appearance who illuminated the whole of the blind men's grove approached the venerable Kumara Kasapa and stood at one side. So standing, the deity said to him, Bhikkhu, Bhikkhu, this anthill fumes by night and flames by day. Thus spoke the Brahmin, delve with the knife, thou wise one. Delving with the knife, the wise one saw a bar, a bar, O venerable sir. Thus spoke the Brahmin, throw out the bar. Delve with the knife, thou wise one. Delving with the knife, the wise one saw a toad, a toad, venerable sir. Thus spoke the Brahmin, throw out the toad, delve with the knife, thou wise one. Delving with the knife, 
the wise one saw a fork, a fork, O venerable sir. Thus spoke the Brahmin, throw out the fork, delve with the knife, thou wise one. Delving with the knife, the wise one saw a sieve, a sieve, O venerable sir. Thus spoke the Brahmin, throw out the sieve, delve with the knife, thou wise one. Delving with the knife, the wise one saw a tortoise, a tortoise, a venerable sir. Thus spoke the Brahmin. Throw out the tortoise, delve with the knife, thou wise one. Delving with the knife, the wise one saw a butcher's knife and block, a butcher's knife and block, a venerable sir. Thus spoke the Brahmin. Throw out the butcher's knife and block. Delve with the knife, thou wise one. Delving with the knife, the wise one saw a piece of meat, a piece of meat, O venerable sir. Thus spoke the Brahmin, throw out the piece of meat, delve with the knife, thou wise one. Delving with the knife, the wise one saw a Naga serpent, a Naga serpent, O venerable sir. Thus spoke the Brahmin, leave the Naga serpent, do not harm the Naga serpent. Honor the Naga serpent. Bhikkhu, you should go to the Blessed One and ask him about the riddle. So, this is the Buddha's answer. The anthill is a symbol for this body made of material form, consisting of the four great elements, procreated by a mother and father, built up out of boiled rice and porridge and subject to impermanence, to being worn and rubbed away, to disillusion and disintegration. What one thinks and ponders by night based upon one's actions during the day is the fuming by night. The actions one undertakes during the day by body, speech and mind after thinking and pondering by night is the flaming by day. The Brahmin, is a symbol for the Tathagata, accomplished and fully enlightened. The wise one is a symbol for a bhikkhu in higher training. The knife is a symbol for noble wisdom. The delving is a symbol for the arousing of energy. The bar is a symbol of ignorance. Throw out the bar, abandon ignorance. Delve with the knife, thou wise one. This is the meaning. The toad is a symbol for the despair due to anger. Throw out the toad, abandon despair due to anger. Delve with the knife, thou wise one. This is the meaning. The fork is a symbol for doubt. Throw out the fork, abandon doubt. Delve with the knife, thou wise one. This is the meaning. The sieve is a symbol for the five hindrances, namely, the hindrance of sensual desire, the hindrance of ill will, the hindrance of sloth and torpor, the hindrance of restlessness and remorse, and the hindrance of doubt. Throw out the sieve, abandon the five hindrances. Delve with the knife, thou wise one. This is the meaning. The tortoise is a symbol for the five aggregates affected by clinging, namely the material form aggregate affected by clinging the feeling aggregate affected by cling, clinging, the perception aggregate affected by clinging, the formations aggregate affected by clinging, and the consciousness aggregate affected by clinging. Throw out the tortoise, abandon the five aggregates affected by clinging. Del with the knife, thou wise one, this is the meaning. The butcher's knife and block is a symbol for the five cords of sensual pleasure, Forms cognizable by the eye that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire, and provocative of lust. Sounds cognizable by the ear, odors cognizable by the nose, flavors cognizable by the tongue, tangibles cognizable by the body that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire, and provocative of lust. Throw out the butcher's knife and block. Abandon the five cords of sensual pleasure. Delve with the knife, thou wise one. This is the meaning. 
The piece of meat is a symbol for delight and lust. Throw out the piece of meat, abandon delight and lust, delve with the knife, thou wise one. This is the meaning. The Naga serpent is a symbol for a bhikkhu who has destroyed the taints. Leave the Naga serpent. Do not harm the Naga serpent. Honor the Naga serpent. This is the meaning. Okay, so. So can, oops, oh, went too far. Okay, so we're gonna go through the layers of the anthill now, but as you can see, and hopefully you can see it, it's, I wonder, no. Oh, I can't see some of the words behind the, uh, the, the different um, people on the screen, but hopefully you can see it okay. But um, I'll go through it with you, so don't worry too much. So as you can see, I've actually put the ant hill upside down. So although the in the dream he delves in from the top, we're actually going to go through it bottom to the top because um, it makes a little bit more sense if we do it in this way rather than the other way around. So we start with the Naga serpent. The Naga serpent. Let's see, I think I have a picture. Yeah, there it is. This is a Naga serpent. The Naga serpent is symbolic for spiritual energy and healing. It's, um, as the Buddha said, it's a bhikkhu who has no taints. And um, <clears throat> it's a powerful, splendid, wonderful. Uh, the Naga serpent was a proud semi-divine race and uh, could assume a physical form either as a human, partial human serpent or a whole serpent. And um, it said that the, the venom and their power made them very dangerous. And in another sutra, in the simile of the snake, the, the Buddha describes the, um, uses the snake as a symbol for the Dharma. So if we grasp it in the wrong way, just like if we grasp a snake in the wrong way, we could easily get hurt and harmed by it. If we grasp a snake in the right way, then we can skillfully extract the venom so that we use it to heal us. The same is um, said for the Dharma. So we don't want to harm this wonderful spiritual energy that has so much potential to heal, that gives us um, life force. And it's nice to start with the sense of spirit. So we come into this body first as spirit. So some people um, believe that we're born first and then the spirit enters us. In a way, it doesn't matter when the spirit is there. Uh, I like to think that the spirit is always there just like the Dharma is always there and it can enter into us. And so this is the, oops, up too far. Oh. Sorry, this is um, my first time doing a PowerPoint presentation, so I'm not sure how to control this. Um, so sorry, let me go back. I know I go back. No, sorry. No. Okay, so once we come into this life, we experience dukkha. So the first noble truth as taught by the Buddha is dukkha. Dukkha is a noble truth. And dukkha includes birth, aging, sickness, death, getting what you don't want, getting what you want. And so after the Naga serpent, when we encounter dukkha, um, the second noble truth is Samudaya. In Samudaya, there are three levels of escape. So the first level of escape is 
um, the piece of meat, which is next um, after the Naga serpent. And a piece of meat uh, symbolizes lust, desire. It's this instinctive, almost animal behavior of like or dislike. There's no thinking. It's like the crocodile that sees a food and snaps. Um, in the first level of sensory escape, we escape through sensory pleasure or pain. So there's dukkha and we avoid it by escaping it through distraction. That is sensual. Greed, craving, hunger, thirst, all of it is in this layer. Okay, no, hopefully I'll get the swipe right. Oops, no, wrong way. There we go. Okay, so in the sutta, it called it knife and block. Um, it's also axe and block. So the sense of um, our, the next, um, The next layer after the um, piece of meat is the axe and block. And this is where this, the senses come in. And so there's another sutra to help understand how the mind works from a Buddhist perspective. Um, and so to help us understand, so this is based on the Chachaka Sutta, which is from the Majjhima Nikai as well, and it's um, Sutta number 148. Now, as we go through our experience of life, we experience it through our senses. In Buddhism, the mind's eye is considered a sense. So in this Sutra, it talks about six internal bases, so we have the usual five senses that we sense things with, and also the mind's eye. And then we have six external bases. And this is, so the X you could say, is the mind in the organ, sense organ, and the block is the object that the sense organ has seen and it comes together really fast so um, in this sense each sense organ has a mind of its own so in the um, early buddhist day the understanding from the time of the buddha is that the mind is like a point and that mind is sticky and it tends to stick to things and so the eye would see something that it likes and automatically it would stick to that object or the opposite. If it didn't like it, it would be repulsed by it. So the same. So we see something, we desire, boom, there's contact. We hear something, maybe gossip, maybe our name, maybe something um, malicious and our ear picks that sound up. Um, the same for um, anything that we like to eat, anything that we like to smell. And our mind also has that with our own internal um, scenes and landscape that go on inside of us. And then each sense organ has a consciousness or function. And so for the eye, it's sight, ear, hearing, nose, smell, tongue, taste, body feeling, the mind's eye would be the internal thoughts. And when each sense organ has the object that it's seen has made contact, um, then the contact will lead to a reaction in us. That reaction will lead to a craving. So the Buddha uses all these sense organs and its functions and the contact, the reaction and craving to demonstrate that there is no self in this. So what we tend to do when we experience the world and we go through life and 
as we get a sense of what we like and what we know, the, the feeling that we are a me, we are an I, we are an identity takes hold. And what the Buddha points out in this sutta is that although it may feel like there's a self, there is no self that is in control and telling the eye to look at something or telling the ear to hear something. Instead, it's the other way around. The eye has a mind of its own. It knows what it's, it likes to look at. It knows what it doesn't like to look at. The ear hears things. Um, has, we don't have control over what we hear. It's the ear that likes certain sounds and doesn't like other sounds. And so the, the Buddha, shows that by looking at each sense organ and saying, is your eye choosing what it wants to look like? If it just um, clings to something and not to something else, then technically there's no self in the eye. And the same with the ear, the same with the nose, the same with the tongue, the same with all the other sense organs. And so, because each of the sense organs has no identity. He says that most of the time we would say, this is me, this is mine, this is myself. But because things rise and fall or things get picked up on and uh, let go of without the self controlling it, then we can't say that this is me. And so by showing that each sense organ has no control over it, the Buddha then teaches that the way to stop this identity formation from happening is to say, well, this is not mine. This I am not, this is not myself. So, so the, the, the first, two layers of this anthill or the, the two bottom ones just after the Naga Serpent have to do with our experience of sensing the world. And from that, repeating certain experiences that then reinforce something that becomes almost ingrained in us as habit and familiarity to the point where an identity of self is created. So the next level in the anthill is the second level of escape from dukkha. So the, the second level of escape is when we start to build a sense of identity. This is an, um, where the me, the I comes in. And the tortoise then, <clears throat> the tortoise symbolizes the skanda process. Now I won't go into the skanda process in this talk, but I'll just say very briefly that the, the aggregates that make up the human, that make up um, the, um, um, well, that, that build the process of identification so that we then have an outlook and a way of seeing the world is a, a cycle. So I don't know if, I'll, I'll just say very briefly what the Skanda cycle comprises of. It's the five aggregates. And uh, it starts with Rupa, which is the form. And then the form that leads to a reaction. So seeing something will lead to a reaction in us. A reaction on us will lead to a certain narrative that we have about that particular thing that we're seeing. And then that narrative goes on building and constructing even more beliefs and ideas about what it is that we've seen in the world so that we create a mentality that's looking out for that object to always be that way that then reinforces our sense of who we are and our sense of who other people are. So this, in, in, in the layer of the tortoise, this is the layer, I guess you could say that the shell is the self that we then develop to protect ourselves from dukkha, from things that have 
been hard to bear, that have caused a bit of suffering that we feel we need to protect ourselves from. And once we start to create this sense of self, there is the separation of the spirit that was connected to everything. And so we then start to feel um, separate from reality, separate from the things that we're perceiving. And with this leads to more craving, more, um, more attachment to the self to protect one from more dukkha. So then the next layer after that in the dream is the sieve. The sieve is also part of the second level of escape. This is also part of the identity formation, me. This is who I am. And the sieve, as you can see, lets some things through, but if there were obstacles, it would catch them. So if you had put the sieve in the water and things were flowing through, eventually it would cause that flow of energy or of water to go through to slow down. And so the sieve represents all of the hindrances for our spiritual life. And so the five hindrances, as in the dream, um, were that the Buddha um, talked about were sensual pleasure, sloth and torpor, ill will, worry and doubt. So these are all the things that slow us down from being really spiritually alive, from progressing further on the spiritual path. And they're all linked into who we think we are, into this identity of the self that has been created over time. And then the next layer, so we're getting closer to the top of the anthill now. Um, this is the third level of escape. Once our self is pretty firm and we have a sense of who we are and we identify very strongly with certain things, the next level which is the third level of escape from dukkha, is the level of destruction. This is when the self that we initially created to protect ourselves from bad things is now actually starting to create difficulties in our life. So the fork represents ambivalence, feeling stuck, not sure what to do, and a fear of making the wrong decision because there's something about the self that needs to know it's making the right, it's doing the right thing. It's going to come out okay. And then the next layer is the toad. So the toad represents despair due to anger. This is very much um, us brooding when we're depressed, when there is so much energy in us that has um, been caused due to disappointment, anger, but instead of allowing that to come out, there's a lid that goes on it. Um, we press it down and we dwell on all the things that didn't go right in our life. And so the toad is also quick to spring. So although it can stay still for long periods of time, if angered or if startled, it could easily jump up and move. So, so in this layer, it's the layer where there's a lot of anxiety and depression. There's a lot of um, self-loathing and a fear of being judged as well. And so there's, I think you can sort of get the sense that 
the spiritual energy that's coming from the Naga serpent is now being really impeded. There's something that's really slowing it down. And to the point where, you know, there's so many other things that um, this layer is holding onto that's preventing a sense of uh, joie de vivre, you could say. And then at the very top of the anthill is the bar. I hope you can see that. I can't really see that on my screen, but it's a level crossing, you know, for a train and there's a stop. So everything has to stop. Nothing can come through. And so this bar represents the, um, you know, this is where there's a refusal to let anything come in. There's a denial, a disconnect from reality, um, refusing to see things as they really are because they'll, um, they won't match our idea of how things should be. And so in this position, the outlook in life becomes very narrow. We feel that um, things are out of control. And so the more we feel things are out of control, the more we need to control our little corner. But it can also be a time when um, one then starts to feel like there is no other option except to not exist anymore. So this is the third level of escape, um, which the Buddha calls oblivion, seeking oblivion. And, and so, so the, the message in the stream is very much that there is something spiritual that is at the base of our lives that we should honor, we should protect. If we can cut through all these um, patterns of habit that we've created, of um, her sheet, if we can cut through the layers of mentality that reveals the process of behavior and habitual process, we can release some of the energy that's been blocked. We can let out some of the, um, the spiritual energy from the Naga serpent to help us live spiritual lives. And by that, um, what um, the Buddha talks about is compassion, living with compassion, living with loving kindness, living with a wholesome sense of um, being okay with whatever happens in life, birth, aging, illness, death, getting what we don't want, not getting what we want. And so Buddhist psychology is um, going beyond the self. It's saying that the self that we tend to create is a protection that ends up being a prison. And if we can cut through, then we can actually release a lot of the energy and so just to finish this talk, and then we'll go into a bit more discussion, um, the, the Buddha talks about the three signs of being, sarva, samskara, anitya, sarva, samskara, dukkha, sarva, dharma, and natma. And so from a psychological point of view, we could say that, um, so I'll translate this first, Sarva samskara means all things compounded. So all things compounded are impermanent. All things troublesome or painful or that cause suffering or affliction. Um, sorry, all things compounded are suffering, are dukkha. And then the last one is all things that um, is the dharma are dharmas our non-self. So our habit patterns and self-structures are impermanent and troublesome. The real things are not self. And the real things are the experiences that we face as existential emotional beings. So we could include feelings and thoughts that come unbidden in us are also the Dharma. So I'll stop there for now and open it up for discussion. Thank you, and I'll stop recording now too.